Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all here today. My name is Ryan Streeter. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for Politics and Governance here at UT. And uh, thank you for coming today to be a part of uh, this installment in our, our fall speaker series. Uh, I'm really excited about today's talk. And I, I think this is a really interesting and original research that, uh, that you'll find interesting as well. We're going to allow our, our speaker today to work through his presentation and the slides that he has, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. So I'm delighted to be able to welcome Jim Besson here today. Uh, Jim is here from the uh, Boston University School of Law where he's a lecturer. Uh, he's also, in his previous life, been the CEO and founder of, of a software uh, startup. So he's been an innovator um, uh, in, the, in the private sector as well as uh, an accomplished academic. So without further ado, if you could join me in welcoming Jim Besson to UT, I'd appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Um, so in the news lately, uh, if you read the kind of news I read, um, the, uh, there's a, a what's a puzzle to economists, which is that corporate profits have risen beginning around 2000 and have stayed high for quite a period of time. So this shows the aggregate operating profit over sales of publicly listed companies in the US. And you can see that uh, around 2000, they, uh, operating margins went up. Uh, economists call this rents, economic rents, loosely speaking. Uh, it's the sort of the supernormal profits. Uh, another way of measuring it is what's called Tobin's Q, the, the ratio of the market value of firms to their assets. The idea is typically a, a the market value should be what worth what it costs to uh, produce the assets of the firm or purchase the assets of the firm. And these two uh, began rising, peaking in around 2000 and coming down slightly, but again, a sustained rise. Now, what's the problem here? Economists like to think of profits as an important incentive to motivate firms to invest, to innovate, to enter new markets. Uh, that's true. Uh, but when we see sustained profits uh, for a long period of time, it suggests that maybe we don't have enough competition, that there's insufficient dynamism. Uh, and there are a number of ways that this can develop. Uh, it's called rent-seeking activity, because those are the economic rents. Uh, there can be barriers to entering markets. There can be restraints on competition of other sorts. There can be a diversion of talent from you know, people going into productive work to say, uh, going into uh, lawyering or lobbying or maybe Wall Street, if you want to, depending on your p opinion of Wall Street. Um, and, and there's some significant in, uh, evidence that there are, uh, has been a problem with dynamism in the US. He, here's one uh, chart that people have focused on, which is the number of startups is declining. Uh, and again, sharply since 2000, particularly in the tech sector. Um, similarly, uh, job creation has declined. So startups and the creation of new jobs um, are seen as being ways of new technologies and, and new markets being opened. And you know, we're seeing a radical drop, particularly in, in uh, the high tech sector, uh, of uh, job creation. So the, the, the sustained rise in profits is troubling. It's also troubling, for, other commentators find it troubling for another reason, which is it contributes to economic inequality. So people like Joe Stiglitz uh, argue that this rise in corporate profits means that for every dollar we produce in this country, a larger portion of it goes to corporate profits and a smaller portion goes to wages, and that contributes to inequality. So he finds it troubling uh, for that reason as well. I'm a tech guy. Uh, I study technology. Uh, and I'm very familiar that uh, technology can also create sustained profits, but for a different reason. And, and it's, it's really an accounting problem. So when firms invest in new technology, uh, that's not really counted as an investment. So it doesn't show up on uh, the, the, the the accounting books the same way as an investment in physical equipment. Um, but nevertheless, firms can earn uh, returns on those investments and often very generous returns on those investments. So 
I was motivated to, to look, this is a well-known problem and people have addressed it a number of ways and there are a number of methodologies for getting at it and measuring you know, what's the contribution of intangibles like research and development spending or spending on marketing. Um, I, what I wanted to do was sort of look at this rise in profits and understand where's it coming from. It could be coming from these intangible investments that we're just not measuring correctly. It could be coming because we're seeing uh, a, you know, a, dec a decline in competition, that industries are becoming more concentrated. And this is an argument made by uh, a number of people, including Jason Furman at the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, or it could be coming relatedly because there's a lot of political rent seeking, a lot of activity direct being diverted from productive activity to uh, generating rents in other ways. So let me elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, intangible investments include things like investments in research and development, investments in advertising and marketing. Uh, people talk about organizational capital investments, building an organization that works a certain way and has very efficient processes. Political rents uh, might arise from legislation, from agency rules or from specific regulatory decisions made by agencies. Uh, rents can happen a variety of different ways. Uh, rents can create exclusive markets, for instance, the radio spectrum or contr government contracts. Patents produce rents. Uh, there are implicit entry barriers. Uh, some people have shown evidence that in some industries, uh, pollution controls act as a barrier to new firms entering. There's also things like rate setting. So uh, government determines the, the prices charged by cable TV or other uh, you know, electrical utilities. Uh, these are regulated markets and firms can lobby to get uh, better rates. And there are all sorts of government payments, explicit or implicit, government contracts, tax breaks, subsidies, bailouts. Um, and any activity that's directed to, oops, wrong way to increasing these things we would call loosely political rent seeking. So this includes things like campaign contributions, it includes lobbying, but it includes a whole other range of activity because they're, you know, the whole regulatory uh, process, all those things that produce rents, you know, are, are, many, are very varied, there are many different discrete things and made by very different people. Um, I, I wanna focus on I'm able to measure one of those in, 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 in a way, regulatory complexity, because there's, there was a new index created. And so I'm going to use regulatory complexity as sort of my catch-all for things beyond just campaign contributions and lobbying. Um, there are a couple of reasons to think that campaign, that there's a lot of rent seeking other than campaign contributions and lobbying, because in fact, most firms don't do either of those. The majority of firms don't. So um, the idea is that regulatory complexity reflects the, the degree to which regulations have been contested, that they reflect the effort that firms put into rent seeking. So a, a regulation will come out and they will push to get exceptions for their firm or their, their niche. Uh, they will make adaptations. They will find loopholes and then regulators will come back and add more complex rules to plug the loopholes. So an example might be copyright law where you have all sorts, it's a very complex document uh, where you have all sorts of regulations on all sorts of media, radio, internet, player pianos, you name it, um, all reflecting different lobbying efforts by different specific industries. So, Here's, what, here's the talk, here's the outline of the talk. First, I'm going to sort of do this statistical decomposition of the rise in profits and see what's causing it. I do find a very significant uh, contribution from regulation and political rent seeking. But then I wanna ask, well, what's the direction of causality here? Uh, do profits promote regulation? In other words, there's some reasons to think that very profitable firms might attract regulators or legislation. Or is it the other way around, that regulation uh, causes profits by restricting entry or doing some of those other things that allow firms uh, to generate rents? And then I'll speculate a little about what these results say uh, about what regulation is doing in general. 
So first, data. Um, I'm, I'm using a methodology that's been widely used in analyzing intangibles. So I, I look at, the basic idea is I, I look at the market value of a firm and decompose it. Uh, you can go look at the details here. I don't think it's going to be particularly interesting to most of you, but basically I get a measure of the market value of the firm, a measure of the assets of a firm, all adjusted for inflation and things like that. Uh, I, stocks of R&D and advertising and, and organizational capital. Uh, I include other measures, things like industry concentration. Um, for po the political variables, the Center for Responsive Politics has data on lobbying expenditures and PAC spending. I'm able to match these to the firm data, uh, and I construct stocks of these. And then I, I mentioned we have this reg data index of, of regulatory complexity. It was uh, composed by Al Ubaidli and Patrick McLaughlin. And basically, they, well, they have two measures. One is they go through the, it's a clever thing they've done. They go through the uh, Code of Federal Reg Regulations. And one thing is they just count the words in each section. The other is they count the restrictive words, words like shall. Um, but the clever thing they did is they did use the machine learning algorithm to match each section of the CFR to particular industries. Um, and that, that match is a probabilistic match, but it still lets us get a measure of regulatory complexity for industry for each year. Um, and so the, the basic assumption is that firms generate rents uh, by sort of the number of these restrictive words or the total number of words times the revenues. It's, it's proportional. So to, to get a sense of what this index looks like here is the electric power industry. And you know, what you see is a general arc over time, but there are also discrete episodes where there was major new legislation and, and the, you know, the, the regulations typically kick up substantially for a year or two or three afterwards. Um, there are also instances of deregulation or you know, this, the electric power industry is one of the more heavily regulated ones. Um, you look at these variables overall, and there's been strong growth in regulation, somewhat slower growth in R&D. Election spending since 2000 has, uh, you know, uh, grown very dramatically. Um, to compare the two key variables, uh, Here's the regulation index in a dash line. Here's the R&D stock to physical capital. And what you see is there was a, there's been a general rise, even predating 1970. Uh, but since the dot-com boom, uh, investments in R&D haven't been as great relative to capital. Firms haven't been investing as heavily in technology. This will be significant for understanding the results. And so the, the basic method, is, and I won't go into the details and the econometrics, and, but it's, it's a, it's a, loosely it's a notion of regressing this Tobin's Q against all these various stocks and seeing what ends up being important. Uh, and I do a similar one for firm operating margins. So if we look at Tobin's Q and we, you know, the rise from 1970 to 2014, regulation and political uh, rent seeking uh, accounts for a very substantial share, somewhat larger than R&D, but that's also significant. These are other factors. Industry concentration accounts for very, very little. Um, it, uh, industry concentration, the measure I'm using here is the market share of the top four firms in an industry. And, and that has grown somewhat, uh, but not very much, um, and it doesn't explain very much. Um, that may simply mean that uh, it's just not a good measure of competitiveness. I do a similar analysis for the rise in operating margins. And here, uh, regulation and political factors account for relatively an even larger share than R&D. So you know, the basic story is intangibles do account for a substantial rise in profits. But surprisingly to me, uh, since 2000 especially, political rent seeking seems to account for more. Um, the question though is, is regulation here a cause or effect? So I, I've shown an, an association. I haven't, I haven't shown anything that says that uh, regulation causes the increase in uh, profits. All right, so I then proceed and do three different tests of causality. Um, 
First, let me pose the question in a more concrete way. So wh why would profits lead to more regulation? Well, we can think historically the, you know, the robber barons attracted the muckrakers who, uh, you know, they, were, they, were, they had a lot of market power. They, had, they were making very high profits. Uh, and in response, we had the trust busters and antitrust legislation. And in a sense, uh, uh, that re was a response to high profits. More, more recently, an example that I'll, I'll use in, in, in sequentially here, um, the 1992 Cable Act. Uh, there was a feeling in the early 90s that cable companies delivered terrible service and charged very high fees. So there was an, an effort uh, in Congress motivated to uh, put them more in line. So that was a case where high profits attracted regulation. Uh, on the other hand, regulation could create profits by generating rents. So that's the the, uh, the other story. So the simplest test is something called Granger causality. If you know what it is, you'll understand this. If you don't, uh, I'll give a, a very simple explanation. But basically, it's, it says that information about past profits uh, does not affect uh, the regulation index but information about the past regulation index affects profits. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a story about timing. Um, it's possible that a third factor uh, could cause both profits and regulation, uh, but to get the, 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 this, it would require that regulators respond more quickly than the stock market, and that seems implausible, especially since regulatory approval cycles are you know, years where stock market purportedly responds very quickly to any news. Uh, I also explore major regulatory changes. So perhaps, you know, there, there's uh, ongoing changes in, in the code, day-to-day -day changes, small things, but then every once in a while there's a major piece of legislation which results in a big, a big change in, in the code. Uh, perhaps these are different. Perhaps there's a collective action problem. Perhaps uh, these are the ones where um, uh, high profits can lead to, to regulation. So I looked at uh, major changes, and I, I arbitrarily chose a 1,000 restrictive words, an increase of a 1,000 restrictive words. I mean, you can get a sense of, a, of, of the major changes in, in banking following the, the uh, Dodd-Frank legislation. Um, I do a probate analysis, which says, looks to explain these increases by uh, pre, uh, lag variables, uh, uh, preceding vari variables in preceding years. Uh, and it turns out that high Tobin's Q or high profits does not lead to uh, these events happening. Finally, I do a, what's a, called a difference in differences uh, analysis. So to, to give you the idea, uh, this shows the, the Tobin's Q for the cable, seven cable firms, uh, in the, uh, and a bunch of other firms. Um, now, in reality, the, the bunch of other firms is carefully chosen, and I do it two different ways, and one is weighted. And, but but the, the basic idea is we, we can see that prior to the legislation, uh, there, there was a difference, but not a difference in trend, and things widened dramatically after the legislation. Um, so we, we, the idea of differences in differ, difference in differences is we compare the differences between the two groups, the treatment group and the control group, before and after. And if we see a, a, a growth in that difference, it tells us, uh, under some assumptions, um, that uh, um, the, the change that we've experienced in 1992 is, is causal. Uh, and so I do, in fact, find a statistically significant uh, a causal relationship flowing from in major increase in regulation to uh, increased Tobin's Q. All right, so what, what does this tell us about what regulation is and does? Um, the, there are lots of theories, and uh, I, I mean, to, to, to my mind, this paper raises more, more questions than it answers. Um, it's, a, it's a different idea about regulation than, than many accounts. So I'll talk about four different accounts of, of uh, what, what regulation does. Um, 
and I'm sure they're all, all true in some cases, but what this is, uh, statistical analysis tells us is that some are more important than others. So one is, is sort of the public interest view. The, the, uh, I, I label them here the public interest view, the toll booth view, the regulatory capture view, George Stiegler, and what we might call systemic capture. Um, so the, the public interest idea is that regulation is created to fix market failures. It's an old idea. Um, the, the 1992 Cable Act was, was, was posed in, in, in those terms. Um, but as we've seen, the causality seemed to be in the, in the wrong direction. It wasn't a case where public regulators came in and fixed things. It was what happened, what happened was um, we had this legislation. Um, it, it did a, aim to, uh, to uh, reduce cable fees. And it did reduce cable fees for certain sorts of cable packages, but the, the legislation became very complex. And what happened was the cable industry just changed their programming around so that they could charge higher fees, actually, uh, for, for various packages and you know, bundles of, of uh, uh, entertainment. Uh, and by doing that, their, their rates did not fall uh, and their profits went up, um, which is what, what we saw before. Uh, so that the, the public interest view doesn't seem to be the main story driving my results here. The toll booth view is the view that, well, politicians and bureaucrats are out there to extract rents from firms. They impose costs. And, you know, there's a lot of literature out there. Uh, the OMB does, uh, you know, cost benefit analysis of, of new regulations. The Heritage Foundation regularly puts out a estimates of the cost of regulation to industry. And you know, the 1992 Cable Act is an example where regulators actually expected uh, that the uh, cable fees would, would drop by 10% or more. Um, but again, the causality in that example is wrong. One of the problems is that a cost to one firm may be an entry barrier to another. Um, so for instance, uh, there's, there's a study finding that uh, in certain industries, EPA regulations uh, increase the costs to uh, firm, prospective firms that might want to enter. Um, and so while they impose a cost on the incumbent firms, they keep out uh, um, uh, prospective entrants and thus act as an entry bar barrier and may actually increase rents. Um, th there's a, a sort of a twist on this. Um, you know, um, is this, a, is this something that changes between Democrats and Republicans or between one politician and another? And, and it, basically, if you look at the complexity of regulation from the last 40 years, uh, it tends to be, show very little variation from one politician to another in the, in, in the White House or in the Congress. Um, there seems to be something much more persistent. So it's not clear that it's any particular group that is extracting rents from firms here. But again, my data seem to suggest this isn't the main story of what's going on. So the Stiegler story is the, the idea that corporations sway regulators either by direct bribery or by soft corruption, things like the revolving door where somebody who works in a, does the right thing while they're a regulator can get a well-paying job afterwards in industry, or what people are calling ca cultural capture, that, that regulators talk to and hang out and assimilate the ideas and the, and the framework of, of thinking of, um, of industry. And so they reflect industry. Uh, so in this story, the causality seems right. It is a story about um, uh, regulation leading to profits. Um, but it, it does seem also that rents rise even when regulators are not captured. And doesn't, this also doesn't explain anything about the rising complexity. So if I go back to the cable example, interesting, Alex Tabarro uh, wrote about my paper on his blog, Marginal Revolution. And one of the commenters was Reed Hunt, who had been a FCC commissioner at that time. And he said, absolutely, our agency was not captured. The industry vilified him. Um, and he, he's right, it, you know, here was a case, he, he was certainly not captured by the industry, but nevertheless, because things get, because of the way the legislation and regulations worked out, they worked in the advantage of the cable industry. Um, so there's a, another story, um, which is the, the notion that 
regulatory complexity is, is itself a kind of capture. Um, that uh, firms push to make regulation more complex in some ways. Um, this gives them flexibility to, to realize rents. The, the cable industry could just change their programming around, or Posner has an example uh, where uh, airlines change their, their offerings uh, in order to realize rents. Uh, complexity makes the regulators more reliant on industry for expertise and information. Um, it may, complexity may also provide a competitive advantage. If, if a large firm can handle the complexity but prospective small entrants can't, it acts as an entry barrier. So we, we see some examples. Philip Morris lobbied to classify tobacco as a drug so it would be regulated by the FDA. They, they felt they could handle the, regu the complexity and their smaller competitors might not. Uh, accountants regularly work to increase the complexity of accounting rules and tax laws. Uh, ExxonMobil support, now supports a carbon tax. Of course, they have, that harms uh, some of their coal intensive competitors more than, than it hurts them. Um, Perhaps the most interesting correlation is the one between regulatory complexity and the number of industry lawyers. Uh, this was from a Goldschlag and Tabarrok paper, but the, the basic story is a, a highly regulated industry is going to have 10 times as many lawyers employed within the industry uh, than a, a lightly regulated one. Finally, what the data show are that a lot of this complexity, regulatory complexity is concentrated in a small number of industries. So we're, most of it, it falls in five broad groupings. The chemical industry, including pharmaceuticals, petroleum refining, refining and related industries, transportation equipment, including defense, utilities, and communications. Um, that accounts for the, you know, the overwhelming part of it. So it's a, a very uneven thing. It's not all industries. Um, so, to conclude, what drove the increase in profits? It appears that intangible investments can explain a significant part of the rise, but that political rent-seeking explains more. Secondarily, this relationship appears causal, particularly with regulation. Regulation is not mainly a response to high profits, but in, in reverse, the regulatory complexity increases profits. And these are substantial. So there's been a, a trillion dollar increase in corporate valuations. Uh, we're talking about about $200 billion a year in higher prices charged to consumers uh, from, just from those estimates. There are some limitations with this study. I sh this is not, this is a, you know, a first pass and this is fairly coarse analysis. Um, there are substantial unmeasured factors. I'm only looking at publicly listed firms, so, and th this is a very important point. It, it may be that large firms benefit from regulatory complexity while small unlisted firms suffer. Um, and that, in fact, might be part of the story. I just don't know. Um, it's limited in a sense because it's driven by a small number of industries, and it's limited because I have a result, but I don't really at this point understand or can demonstrate the details of what's driving that result. What exactly about regulation is going on here? It does raise two general worries. Uh, one is that political rents seem to be concentrated in just a few industries and this might have the effect of skewing policy for the entire economy. So for example, patent law, which is something that uh, um, I focus on in much of my other work, um, Pharma, uh, which is one of those highly regulated industries, has played a, a very strong role uh, and, and has great political influence. And basically, they've prevented patent reform that the tech industry wants. Um, that might not be the best thing for the economy overall. It might be the best thing for pharma. Uh, secondly, this is a recent and growing problem. It's since 2000. Uh, there's been a tremendous ramp up in campaign spending. Uh, there's been a constant growth uh, at a, a significant rate of regulatory complexity. Uh, I would have to guess, if asked, that uh, 
we were only seeing the beginning of it, and, and this, is, this is going to be a trend for some time to come. And so it's somewhat worrying. Thank you. Well, we're looking actually at profit rates or operating margins. So we're, we're, the scale of industry isn't really a factor. I, I, I'm st but still, you might have an interesting idea. I just don't quite understand wh why. So the, um, I'm, I'm, I know that I'm not thinking about, about profit margins instead of, instead of raw profits, which is what I was under the impression of. Um, but the, the behavior regulators, I don't, I don't understand. I can understand the effect of regulators, um, but I, I'm still waiting. I mean, I mean, right. Methods, right? The mechanism is unclear here, um, but it seems to me like they're chasing something else. They don't say, you know, hey, you know, the pharma, the pharma is really profitable right now. Let's go after them. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's the way it works, and I don't. There are a lot of regulators out there who are go to work every day and have the interest of the public at heart and are doing their jobs. And I mean, that's not that's not what I'm I'm, I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is sort of what's driving these what, what seems to me to be striking results um, that related to corporate profits. And, and 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 so it may speak about the economic impact of regulation. Uh, most of the pol of political science seems to come at the question of regulation differently than I think economists do. So they're looking at how do regulators make decisions. If I want to see regulatory capture, I'm going to look at case studies of did these people make decisions favoring industry or not. I'm sort of stepping way back and saying, okay, w you know, what's the evidence about competition here? Uh, um, and that's a that's a particularly a particularly narrow question I'm asking. Um, but with, with, you know, very large impact. Um, so it's, we, 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 I, th I think what it's, what it's saying is we need to come up with a sort of an integrated and comprehensive understanding of regulation that it's not, we don't want to think just about individual decisions. We need to think about the sort of the broader scope of things and the complexity of what's going on may be a big part of the story. So I think that's a possibility, yeah, yeah. Uh, you would wonder why wouldn't they? In other words, if they're getting rents, why wouldn't they um, influence where they could? But, it, but I think it's a, di maybe the thing is it's a different idea about influence. It doesn't have, you know, it doesn't require bribery. It doesn't require, right. you, you know, you, you can be dealing with somebody like Reed Hunt who think thinks he has the, the public's interest at heart, and yet nevertheless, somehow we come up with a set of rules that uh, if you look at, I, th I think if you look at the industries where the regulation has gotten so complex, some of them involve complex technology, most not so much. Econ economists have a, an, an, there are a number of things, and, and this has been a, a very big issue. I think the Microsoft antitrust uh, debacle, uh, <laughs> Is, is probably a, a good point. But uh, in many tech industries, uh, they're subject to what are called network effects. So that the, the more dominant you become, the, more, the ever more dominant you will become, um, uh, which tends to lead to a few dominant firms. It becomes very difficult for the number fourth or number fifth firm to survive very long or do very well. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not competitive. Uh, so the argument made is that maybe the Microsoft browser was a monopoly at some point, but there were competitors coming on the market, and it's been, it you know, it, it's been replaced. That that there are they're not direct competitors. They're 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 op, you know they're, they're competitors by obsolescence. Um, so it becomes, and in any case, in terms of the, the antitrust law, it becomes just a complex, very difficult problem, and the tools really aren't there to, to rein in the tech industry if we did think that was what was needed. Um, so there's, a, I, think many, I think many economists, economists were divided about the Microsoft trial, 
Um, but that, that was really not about the general issue of can you have just, is it bad to have dominant firms, but it was whether uh, Microsoft was abusing the dominance. I, 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 first off, I just don't know enough about what's going on to, to even come close to thinking about solutions. Um, but something like transparent, but you're talking about transparency in terms of political giving. Um, you, you know, there is already a fair amount of transparency of po political giving. What, what's less transparent is maybe what's going on in, in the regulatory process. But, you, you know, when you have very complex regulation, so some political scientists have sort of looked at this, this problem of complexity and, and, and come away with this idea that, um, you know, even if regulators aren't bought and paid for, uh, things may favor industry. Um, and, and maybe that's what we're seeing. And so with, when you have that sort of problem, I'm not sure how you solve it. Well, not, not only is it what they care about, it's what they can understand and what they have the expertise to, to deal with. So, you, you, you know, you look at these very, you know, you think about the cable regulations. If you, you try reading some of that stuff, if you want to <laughs> get a headache, um, you know, you, it's, it's very hard to understand what's going on and, and then understand what it means, you know, in, in practical terms. Um, uh, it's just, it's just inaccessible. It's a, diffi it's a difficult problem of... And, and it's, it, there, there's been a long-standing problem of how do you deal with complex technology and regulation? And what this seems to be suggesting is that there's something even more nefarious going on, that um, the, the way we, we are dealing with it is leading to uh, undue political influence, or op creates openings for undue political influence. Well, so, well, we've, we've talked about some of these things. Is that you know I, I don't really understand what's going on. We, we, we want to think about. I want to be able to understand, you know, which which industries is it that and and why, and which agencies is it and why, and what are the differences between them, and that may shed some light on uh, the, the more specific dynamic. There may be other other clever ways people can get at what's going on. Uh, there's another line of research, so some economists are, are, are pretty interested in, um, it's been, economists basically don't have a good way of measuring industry competitiveness. Uh, so they've used things like the, the four, you know, the, the market share of the top four firms. Um, but everybody understands in a certain way that's not a very good measure for a variety of reasons. You can have, you know, you could have four national firms that dominate an entire, um, the entire national market uh, and compete intensively online. Uh, and so this high level of competition, even though you have only four firms, or you could have a thousand firms each in, in a different town and they don't compete with each other at all. They each have a monopoly. And so there's very little competition. Um, and you, you know, the, so the four firm share doesn't matter much. What this seems to be saying is regulatory complexity may give us an instrumental variable that lets us uh, do some interesting analysis about competitiveness without being able to necessarily uh, measure it ideally. Uh, and so that opens up a bunch of questions, the, the, such as what's the role of competitiveness in R&D spending or investments in innovation? Um, so the, there's some interesting things about how that works. What's the, uh, one thing to look at would be the, what's the role of, of regulation and, um, Employment patterns, employment of lawyers, employment of R&D personnel. Uh, what's the relation between uh, co industry competitiveness and wages? So there's, there's a whole argument that uh, firms that make rents may share their rents with uh, their employees and that this may actually be growing dispersion in, in rent, economic firm, firm economic rents may lead to growing wage inequality. Uh, and there's some evidence that highly, these, some of these highly regulated industries tend to have higher, higher industry wages after taking 
factors into account. So there, there are a lot of interesting questions. It's any time we get a, a, a new yardstick that lets us measure something we couldn't measure before, um, there are interesting things to do. In the simplest sense, it's just how complex are the regulations for this particular agency? So I think you have to, economists have written a, 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 a bit about this. Manker, Mansur Olson, um, Ann Kruger. Um, and so the, the and, and there isn't, I think, good empirical evidence. It's, it's just anecdotal sort of evidence. Um, so there, are, one idea is that the regulations become more complex when industries are pushing to get specific exceptions. So the piano player industry wants the copyright law to protect them a certain way, or internet radio is, has to be dealt with in a certain way. A second argument is that regulations come out and certain industries find a loophole if, if, they're, if they're aggressive about rent seeking, they'll find a loophole to work around it. And so regulators will add more to the code to, to plug the loophole. Um, the, the general idea is though that it's by, uh, I, I, and I guess there's a third idea that Olson brings up, which is, is um, industries actually push intentionally to make things more complex because it gives them the upper hand. They, they have the expertise to uh, know what outcomes should be. Uh, the regulators will inevitably rely on them and, and their expertise in, in a very complex field. Um, so all of these things pushing over time provide an explanation about why complexity has grown over time. Uh, empirical evidence as to why, whether that's true or not, not, you know, not there and it's an interesting question. Um, yeah, the reg data people, you know, have, have basically they have the, these measures not only by agency but by section and paragraph of the code. Um, I, I believe the EPA is the most, you know, has the most words in its regulations and, and, and it goes down from there. But, um, So, yeah, so understand, I'm not, this analysis is at firm level profits, not industry level profits, number one. So, it, so they're more profitable net of what they're spending on lobbying. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also numbers of studies, so it's very interesting that the returns on lobbying turn out to, and, and even more so on political camp campaign spending, <coughs> if you do just a, a simple analysis you know, profits regrets against, against lobbying, and it's, it's in my numbers too, they're very, very high. It's like, you know, every dollar I spend on campaign spending, I'm gonna get $400 back in profits or something. Um, I think what that means in, in reality, so this has been a puzzle by, some people have considered this a puzzle in literature. I, I think the simpler explanation is, is uh, the, the campaign spending or the lobbying expenditures are only a small part of a total sphere of activity, um, they're just sort of the tip of the iceberg that we can measure, uh, and, which is why also we're seeing sort of the regulatory complexity index picking up most of the action. Um, but so, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a case where they're, they're making net profits. All right, very good. Uh, fascinating stuff, Jim. Thank you. You've given us uh, items to continue to debate and discuss going forward. Thanks to all of you for coming today. Um, if you're not on our list, uh, you can sign up when you leave with Lauren and Hannah in the back um, to receive uh, announcements for future events. And I think, do we have our cards back there with events on them? Oh, and on the chairs, right. So if you want to uh, see what else is on the docket for this fall semester, just check out the, the cards on your, on your seats. Please join me again in thanking Jim Besson for his comments today. Thank you.